you remember uh, a few classes back, we spoke about how about doing inserts, updates, and deletes. And we said um, that we could do inserts, updates, and deletes two ways, essentially. And in fact, this isn't just about inserts, updates, and deletes. This is really about um, um, anything that, that, the, that you do when you use a framework. When you use a framework, you always have two choices. You can always use a framework or not use a framework. Um, there are tons of advantages of using the framework, um, namely that typically a lot of the work is done for you, so you don't have to, uh, to hand code something. And it's not a question of whether you can hand code it or not. It's a question of where it's best to spend your time. On any project, there's going to be plenty of chances for you to write your own code and, 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 and do things like that. Um, but it's pick your spots. You know, if, if, if the tool can do something for you already uh, and it doesn't require a lot of effort, then, then by all means, use the tool, use the framework to do that. Um, but on the other hand, there's times that you want to do something that maybe is a little bit not standard. All right. The example that we had last time is we wanted to do an insert into the vote table, and not all the data was entered for um, was entered by the user. Some of it came from the query string, some of it came from a session variable. So in cases like that, it might be just as easy for us to write our own code instead of trying to force the framework to do something against the natural way that it works. So understand the framework, understand the way that it works, understand sort of the default behaviors of the framework. And then look and say, well, is it worth it to try to bend the framework to get it to do what I want, or am I better off just writing my own solution? But you can only do that if you know both ways, right? You can only make that call if you know how to do it yourself and how to use a framework uh, to do it. So therefore, I stress knowing how to do both of those. So today we're going to do um, inserts, updates, and deletes, at least we're going to try to do all of them, um, using the framework and using the tools that we've had so far. And those are the grid view and the details view. Now there's other views as well, by the way, and we'll probably talk about them sometime next week. Um, because the details view and the grid view have a very specific and a very rigid look to them. They're both tables. Sometimes people want a little bit more free form than that in which case you have the repeater view for that. At any rate, I'm going to go and log on and download what we were working on last week, and we'll do some things using the grid view and the detail view. We talked about the insert statement. I don't recall talking about the update or delete statement. <coughs> Let's put examples of the update statement up on the board and put examples of the delete statement. And let's talk about what can go wrong with, with them before we go and discuss them any further. An update statement looks like this. I forget the names of the I forget all the names of the tables, so I'll just make up a table, and we'll talk about that hypothetical table. Let's say we have a customer table that has a customer ID as its key. and has a first name, last name. birthday, and let's say sales rep ID, where that's a foreign key to the sales rep table. So let's say that that's our table. 
let's assume this is an auto number key. The insert statement, we talked about that last time, but just to review, it would be something like this. Insert into customer the list of fields. Again, assuming that customer ID is an auto number key. statement would look like this. And we talked about the things that could go wrong with this. Alright? Um, the, the things that could go wrong would, first of all, be something like um, if we were missing a field that was required. So if there was no value for first name, and first name was a required field in the database, that would cause this to blow up. Also, if sales rep ID was not a valid sales rep, Remember, when you define something as a foreign key, essentially you're saying that whatever value you put in here will match up with one of the rows in this table. So if you had sales reps 1 through 10, and you tried to do an insert with sales rep 20, that would blow up. All those things are forms of constraints being violated. Um, in essence, unless you have some sort of... Uh, Syntax error where you're trying to insert five values and there's only four spots or you got some things in the wrong order or whatever. Most of the errors that you're going to get that are runtime errors um, are going to be due to violating the constraints of the database. Inserting a duplicate key would be one example. We're not going to run into that in this case because we have an auto number key, but in other tables where you don't have an auto number key, you could be trying to insert the same row twice. So you could get an error there. Foreign key constraints, required field constraints, all those things could cause this to blow up. All right? And it'll blow up at runtime. Now we talked about ways that we could fix that from happening, ways that we could prohibit that from happening. We can pro prohibit that from happening by doing validation. For example, we could put if we had a form that you entered in the first name, you could put a required field validator on the first name. And then they would have to enter. We talked about using a drop down instead of allowing someone to key in the sales rep ID. All right, so there'd be a drop down where you would select the sales rep ID. That would be a way that you could make sure that, um, that you uh, didn't violate the constraints of the database and so on. Then we talked about there's a category of errors that you can't necessarily um, pre prevent, right? Like the database being down, the database being crashed, or the database file being renamed, or whatever. And we talked about using try catches for those kinds of errors. In addition, there might be errors that we couldn't anticipate. Just we haven't thought through the problem enough, and we didn't really anticipate them. And try catches can be beneficial in catching those errors as well. All right. So we sort of have a two-fold strategy in preventing errors, right? We can, by designing our form and by putting validation in, we can keep some errors from happening. And by putting try-catches in, we can catch an error if it happens and handle it the way we want to handle it instead of just letting it blow up. So that's an insert statement. Update statements look like this. There are, by the way, to be complete, there are other forms of the insert statement. But for the kind of applications we're doing, this is primarily the form we would be using. The update looks like this.
it, it has a where clause, just like a select statement has a where clause. And the where clause serves the same role here. All right? A select statement says what statement, what, what rows do you want to include in your output. Um, and the where clause says which specific rows you're interested in. In this case, it says which specific rows we want to update. What would happen if we omitted the where clause in this? Well, we're not inserting. This is the update. And so what would it do? It would update everything. Right, exactly. So it's just like a select statement. If we have a select statement and we don't have a where clause, what do we get? If I said select star from customer, and I don't have a where clause, I only get, uh, I would get every single customer. Same thing with an update. If I were to say update customer and then specify some update rules and I didn't specify which ones I wanted to update, it's going to update them all. <laughs> so that's not good and the where clause is essential. Now, the same things can go wrong with the update as <coughs> can go wrong with the insert. In other words, I could try to get rid of the first name, I could try to put blanks in the first name or put in an invalid sales rep ID or something like that. I could violate the constraints of the database or violate the data type, try to update the birthday with something that wasn't a date, for example. Um, and that would cause it to blow up. Or I could try to update it with an invalid sales rep ID and that would blow up. I have the additional issue of getting the where clause wrong. If I get the where clause wrong, it's, it's, uh, it's going to uh, not update what I want it to update. All right. Question: If it doesn't update anything, let's say I say, let's say I say update customer set first name equals something, last name equals something, where customer number equals 500, and there is no customer number 500. Does it give you an error? Yes. Actually, that makes sense, but it doesn't work that way. It doesn't give you an error. Because it did, did its job. It went in and updated everyone whose customer number was 500. And if there's no one with customer number 500, well, it did its job. It didn't update anyone. It's kind of like saying select, you know, select uh, star from customer where name equals Zellers and there was no Zellers in the database. Right? That's not an error. It, 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 gave me, it gave you everyone whose name was equal to Zellers, and that was no one. It updated everyone whose customer number was 500, and there just happens to be no one who has that as a customer ID. So oddly enough, it doesn't give you an error if it doesn't update anything. Mm -hmm. All right? And that's an important thing to remember when you're debugging, because when you're debugging, if your update doesn't work, one of two things will happen more than likely. Number one is it will blow up, all right? Or number two is it'll look like it worked, but your data hasn't changed. So those are two different conditions, and therefore it's important to recognize that if it doesn't blow up, that doesn't mean that the update was successful. If there's a problem with the where clause, it could mean that it updated the wrong thing or that it didn't update anything, all right? Lastly, the delete statement. The simplest of them all, but the most dangerous of them all, because you're getting rid of stuff, right? You delete an entire row, all right? So there's no columns listed here. I don't say delete and then supply the name of columns. I'm deleting the entire row. So when I do a delete, I'm deleting everything. Delete from customer where customer ID equals question mark. Again, if you put in a customer ID that doesn't exist, it won't delete anything, but it won't give you an error. Yeah, I got rid of everyone whose customer number was 500. 
Well, there wasn't anyone whose customer number was 500, but I got rid of all of them. If you omit the where clause, it's going to try to delete everything in that table. Just like if you omit the where clause on a select statement, it returns everything that's in the table. With a delete, it'll try to delete everything. Now, with a delete, there's an additional problem that you run into, and that is with foreign keys. Let's say, for example, the customer number was a foreign key in an order table. Let's say there's an order ID and some other fields and then a customer ID. Again, if that's the case, what that is saying is every row in this table, the customer ID for a given row has to match one of the customers in the customer table. That's what a foreign key means. All right? And that, that allows for what's called referential integrity. And that's a great thing. That, that helps databases give you more accurate uh, data. All right? But let's say we have a customer number 100. And let's say there are three orders for customer number 100. And I try to delete the customer. Here's what can't happen. I can't delete customer number 100 from the customer table and leave these orders in the order table. That's not allowable. All right? Why is that not allowable? Because I have created a foreign key, which means that every row in this table has to have a customer ID that matches one of the customers in this table. So if this has customer number 100 and this does and this does, I can't get rid of customer 100 because then they would no longer have customer IDs that pointed to a customer in the customer table. And the database won't allow that. So that can't happen. All right? Now, you have a choice of how to deal with that, though. All right? You as a database designer and an application creator have a choice how to deal with that. Other databases provide more options, but within Access and within every database, you will have typically at least two options. One of those options is to restrict deletion. What do you suppose that means if I restrict deletion on that foreign key? Pardon me? Well, actually restrict deletion means something a little bit different than that. It wouldn't allow you to delete if there was a matchup in the second table. So if I when I define the foreign key, I get to choose whether I'm going to restrict deletion or cascade deletion. Or if I don't cascade it, then I'm restricting deletion. And if I restrict deletion, that means that I cannot delete a customer, in this case, that has an order for it in the order table. So if there's an order, if there's even one order for customer number 100, I will not be able to delete them in the database, in the customer table. If you go to delete them, it will, it will give you an error. All right? That's one option. The other option is cascade delete. And what does cascade delete mean? Well, that means if it deletes, it will delete the customer and it will delete every row related to it. So this is a one case of a statement. Well, this delete statement could actually affect more than one row in more than one table. Because if I have cascade delete set, if I were to delete the customer, then it would delete all the orders that belong to the customer. Now, when you're designing the database, that's a decision you have to make. Because I can't say that one is always right or the other is always right. In some cases, you want to be able to cascade deletes. Right? 
So for example, if someone were to delete an order on Amazon, you know, you place an order on Amazon, it's probably in two database tables, right? It's probably in the order table, and it's probably in uh, a line item table. If I cancel my order, I probably want to cancel my order for all of my items. So it's going to delete all of my items off the order, all right? On the other hand, if I had a sales rep, let's say I tried to delete something from the sales rep table, the sales rep quit our company. I wouldn't want to be able to delete the sales rep and have it delete all the customers that belong to that, that were, were assigned to that sales rep. That wouldn't make sense, right? So I would restrict deletion there. So before I could delete the sales rep, I'd, make, I'd want to make sure that all their customers were reassigned to a different sales rep, and then I could delete it. So you really, when you're designing the database, picking whether you restrict or cascade deletes is an important decision, and you do it for every foreign key that you set up. Now these things can chain together too, right? The order might have a foreign key to something else, and that table might have a foreign key to something else. And if it ever, at any point in that chain, there's a restriction of deletion, then the whole de uh, uh, delete is, is aborted, all right? A delete either succeeds or fails completely. It won't partly delete something and leave something else out there. So if at any point in these foreign keys, the chain of foreign keys, you run into a restrict deletion, if there are any rows out there, then the whole delete is abandoned and you're not able to delete anything from there. All right, any questions about this? Now let's go and let's actually do this using uh, a details view and a grid view. Now. It's going to involve us writing the SQL statement as part of our um, SQL, uh, SQL data source. So previously we've written the select statement, now we're going to write the insert, update, and delete statement. Now, something to keep in mind. With a grid view, you cannot do an insert. With a details view, you can do insert, update, and delete. With a grid view, you can only do update and delete. Now, I'm going to do this example, but I'm not going to pay uh, attention to common sense for, for a minute. We'll talk about that later on. We'll talk about common sense next week. Ironically, we'll probably be talking about common sense on the day of the election, which seems maybe not necessarily the best idea, but maybe it is a good idea. It sounds like a great topic. Sounds like a great topic, right. When, when I say I'm going to not care about common sense, I'm going to create things that you probably wouldn't put in an, in an actual application at first, just to demonstrate how it works. So for example, right off the bat, I'm going to allow anyone to go in and, in, uh, and, and edit or delete a question from the table. Well, that's probably not a good idea, right? You wouldn't want anyone to be able to go in and change a question or delete it. You'd probably want only administrators to be able to do that, all right? so. But again, bear with me. Uh, likewise, we're going we're gonna to write something to insert, update, and delete a customer. And the way that works is going to be a little bit awkward. Not customer, but user, rather. And the way that's going to work is going to be a little bit awkward. But again, bear with me. We'll talk about how we can modify this to be workable. All right? Because remember, you always have to keep your design hat on. What you do has to make sense for the problem that you're trying to solve. And you'll see what I mean as I specifically go into some things, but that's just sort of a warning. Today we're just trying to get the basics down. We're not we're not worried about we're not worried right now today about how it fits in with the rest of the application. We'll worry about that um, next week. All right. So let's go in and let's open up this application.
Can you also get the door? Thank you. This allowed me to um, simply view all the polls. We're going to add an edit and delete to it. and then there's a visual aspect of it. And we need to address both of these for this to work. We have to write the SQL statements that will allow us to update and delete. And then we have to write the, um, have to make changes to the, um, what do I want to say here? To the visual, to the grid view, to accommodate that. So there's always two things working here. All right, so I'm going to go in here and configure data source. our select statement. Using this technique, by the way, works best if your select statement only involves one table. Now, you might ask what if it involves more than one table, and there's ways to get around that. All right? There's ways that you can, you can get that work, uh, to work without using joins. So, what I'm going to do is I'm going to build this one step at a time, and I'm going to do the delete first. All right. So I'm going to go in here. From poll, where poll ID equals question mark. All right, that's my delete statement. Now again, it's possible to write delete statements that don't use the primary key in the WHERE clause, but for the most part, we are always going to be using the primary key. And I'm going to do the update statement as well. Update the poll set question text equals question mark, comma, 
date created equals question mark, comma, date expired equals question mark, where poll ID equals question mark. We. <laughs> Where? All right. I'm going to say no to this, and that might be a mistake. Actually, I'm going to say yes to this. Live on the edge. Say yes. Well, I know what it's going to do. It's not living on the edge. When, it, when, it, when I do this, it's going to get rid of anything custom that, I, that I've added to this. It's going to regenerate that, that data grid, that grid view, rather. So it's going to get rid of my little vote link here. But I can handle that. So I will say yes, and there it got rid of that. So I could always go and re-add that in. Um, sometimes it's worth it to do that, even if you have to go back in and, and add that in. All right? So I'll go and do that now um, on my grid view. I'm going to do edit columns. And I had a link. And the link was, the, the text for the link was vote. And the data navigate URL fields, I was passing the poll ID. And the URL was, I think it was vote.aspx, question mark equals ID equals, or question mark ID equals curly bracket zero. What does the curly bracket zero mean again in that? Zero is where you pass the ID. That's where I'm going to pass the ID. And the, the zero is going to be the, the first element on this list. Well, there's only one element on the list, so I'm going to put the poll ID there. That way it will make sure that I'm passing it correctly. Okay, so we should be back with that. Now, what I'm going to do, what I need to do, though, is I need to say that I want to enable editing and enable deleting. Actually, I clicked on them in the reverse order. Enable editing and enable deleting. All right. Now, later on when we're talking common sense next week, we could talk about how we could look at the user, and depending on the user, we could enable the deleting and delay, uh, enable the editing. All right. Well, right now, we are just going to um, always allow uh, editing and deleting, even though in practical cases wouldn't be a good idea for this. So we've taken care of both things. Remember, whenever you want to do something um, database-wise using a framework, you have the visual representation of it, which in this case is a grid view, and you have the data source, which is a SQL data source. So I create created the update and delete statements in the SQL data source, and I clicked on the boxes to enable deleting and enable editing. So let's go and try this. Let's see if it works.
mark on the end of that one. So I'm going to click at it. Notice what happens. Everything that was in a label, all of a sudden is in a text box. All right. Except poll ID. Why do you suppose poll ID isn't in a text box? That's the primary key, right? So there's really no, no reason to be changing that. So I'll go in and I will put the question mark in here. And I'll click update. And one of, thing, one, one of two things is going to happen. It's going to work or it's not going to work. All right? I could click cancel, by the way, and that would back me out of editing mode. But if I click update, Like the Indians yesterday, keeping me in suspense. And it worked. All right, there is a question mark there now. All right. So see how easy that is. All right. But keep in mind that's a little deceptive, right? This is easy, and this went so straightforward because this is the absolute most basic, simple kind of update you would ever do, where you just have a bunch of text boxes and you go in and all that. In fact, this update is far from foolproof, right? Because I could go in here and type garbage in for the date, and I go to update it, probably nothing good is going to happen. Sure enough, it didn't work because I didn't enter a date there. Again, we'll talk about that more going forward. Now, let's look at the database. Let's look at the database, all right, before we try the delete. There is a foreign key relationship between poll and answers. So if I click on it and say edit relationship, we are cascading delete. What that means if I delete the poll, it will delete all the answers associated with that. I'm going to turn that off for now. And what's the opposite of cascade? Restrict. So I'm going to go and save that. Close out of here. And I'm going to go and run this, and I'm going to try to delete one of the polls. I click delete on that, and I get an error. And it tells me this record cannot be deleted or changed because answers includes related records. That's telling me that the, that the deletion was restricted due to a foreign key constraint. All right, the thing that I just changed a second ago. All right. Now, obviously, this isn't a good solution. All right. This, is, uh, this gives us an ugly um, error message. Now, I could go in and... If I were to go in and change the foreign key to say delete, or to cascade deletes, then if I go and run this, It deletes it, no problem. And if we look at the database table, it's gone from the poll table 
but the answers are also gone. So it took out the answers along with it. I'm going to change this back to restrict. So now I will no longer be able to delete any poll that has some answers for it. All right, so we're back to the first scenario. We made it restrict, so I'm not allowed to delete that. Now that's an ugly error, all right? This is actually an exception. If we read this closely, we'll see exception details, system data, OLADB, OLADB exception. So we learned last time how to handle exceptions, right? How did we say we handled exceptions last time? The try catch. So we put the code, put put the code that's doing the deletion in the try catch. So that would seem to be a reasonable thing to do this time, right? You can tell them up to something, right? However, if we look at the code behind. Guess what? There isn't any code. Ooh, what do we do? There's no code for us to put our try catch around. Why is there no code to put the try catch around? Obviously, there's a deletion happening somewhere. All right? We just haven't written the code for it. So where does the code live then that does a deletion? Well, it lives in the framework. All right. Somewhere in the framework of a page and a, um, a, a grid view and a SQL data source, there's a code that causes that row to be deleted or to be attempted to be deleted. All right. And yet we don't have access to that code. They don't give us a code for the framework. So we can't put try catches in our code. However, the framework gives us some hooks where we can put our own logic to deal with errors, all right? Now, we've seen events before, right? Right now, we're staring at an event, page load. When does that event occur? Well, it occurs when the page loads, right? When you first go into a page. We've looked at, like, on item, on selected item changed event of a drop down. We could write code that if someone changes an option in a drop down. All right. So we can do that. We've done a, an on click event on a button. Someone clicks on a button that causes an event to happen. There are events within the framework that get fired up automatically. And sometimes they're the result of a user action, and sometimes they're just a chain of events that happen within the framework. Those events we can write code for, and those events are our hook into putting in air trapping in this case. So I'm going to look at SQL data source.
Greasy forgot how to add an event here. Let's see if we can do this here. On the grid view, we say on row deleting equals ah, create new event. All right. So, I created a vamp, and I was mistaken. I used the wrong event. So we're going to delete this and start over, which is good because I kind of messed up anyhow. So I'm going here, and I'm going to delete the event, and there. On row. Deleted equals. I'm going to create, click a new event. I'll call it grid view. Now I look in the .cs. I'll change that to grid view. This is a code that's going to happen after the row gets deleted. All right. At this point, the delete 
has either succeeded or failed. We simply need to test some parameters to find out if it succeeded or failed. All right, and then appropriately take action. Well, how do we know if this event succeeded or failed? Well, this event gets notified via these arguments. All right. Let me review this from the beginning. I create a event on my grid view. Where'd it go? On my grid view for on row deleted. When does that event fire off? It fires off after an attempt was made to delete a row from the database. This isn't something I made. Something I made that's called framework called whenever a row is attempted to be deleted. Alright? I've created a function that gets called now when that event occurs. So when a row gets deleted from this grid view, I call this function here. Grid view row deleted. Here's where I can put the code that looks to see if it was successful or failure. How do we know if it's successful or failure? We look at this event argument. Specifically, we look at if e dot oops, exception equals no. Or we can flip that around and say if not. Oops. Not equal no. What does an exception not equaling null mean? It means that there was an error. Right? So if there was an error, if there is an exception, it means that the exception is not null. And if there is an exception, it means that there is an error. So we should somehow notify the user of that. So I'm going to go in here, and on my grid view, I'm going to put a label. And I'm going to call it label error. And I'm going to give a text of nothing initially. And if there is an exception, I'm going to say label error e uh, dot text equals problem deleting. Let me correct some of my spelling errors here. Now let's go and try and run this. Now if I try to delete this, we 
record cannot be deleted, I still get the same error. to tell the framework that I've handled this exception. And I do that by saying E exception handled equals true. That's essentially us telling the framework I got this one. All right. So you don't need to worry about displaying any errors. All right. That's what I forgot to do. So let's try this one last time. deleted. Alright. Notice we didn't get the ugly error. Alright. Now, without testing the exception, we don't necessarily know exactly what went wrong. But we can make some pretty good guesses. Maybe the problem is, is that there are answers associated with this poll. So I could put my, I could make my error message descriptive and say problem deleting, you cannot delete a poll for which there are answers. Okay? And in that way, we're providing the user with some information about what probably happened. Now it could be something else too. You know, it could be that there is a problem with the database and so on. We could log this error, like I said before. We could create a log file and update it. But the point is, is we're handling this. All right? We're handling the error. And it's similar to a try-catch, but it's not exactly the same because we have no code to put our try-catch around. So we have to tap in to the framework's events and after the delete happens, we have to see if it was successful or not by testing that exception property. There are a whole bunch of events. There is a item or, or a row inserted event. There is a row updated event. In addition, there are events that are phrased in the present tense, which means they're going on now. Row deleting versus row deleted. Which one do you think happens first? Row deleting or row deleted? Deleting. Deleting happens first. Row deleting happens So if there's some code that you have to put in before it gets deleted, you would put it in the row deleting event. If there's code that you want to put in after the deletion was attempted, like catching errors and so on, you would put that in the deleted event. So we'll see as we go through and do more of these, all right, um, that there are events that we can put in that will catch these things, all right, and will tell us if there is an error. But again, remember, error catching is only one of the strategies that we can take to deal with errors. All right? We can also do things like validation. That's what we'll pick up next time. Uh, looking at the clock, we have about 10 minutes left. I don't really want to start. But I want to talk about this problem next time. If I click edit for this, I get a text box. I could put some garbage in as a date. And I click update. Boom, we have a big error. All right. Now, I could handle this the same way that I handled the deletion. Right? I could go into the item updated, a row updated event. All right? And I could put code to look for an exception. And if there was an exception, I could display an error message and so on. 
But it seems like there should be a better way to deal with it than that. We've talked about validation controls. All right. Why not add a validation control to this? And that's exactly what we're going to do next time. It's not as easy as it is. We have to go through a little bit of a process to be able to add that. We have to create what's called a template column. And we'll create a template column for this that will allow us to go in and put any validation controls we want to. So we could put a required field validator. We could put in, um, you know, anything that we want to um, with this. And uh, the validation will happen, and we won't even then get the error. Because it's better to prevent, if, you, if at all possible, it's better to prevent the error than letting the error happen and then trying to clean up from it. Any questions at this point? All right, remember your, your design is due today, I believe. Or is it due next week? Next week. Next week. Okay, your design is due. I'm confused because of my 216 <laughs> class that's due this week. Well, don't scare us. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> I apologize. Uh, at any rate, uh, let me know if you have questions about that. I will go and unlock the lab, and then I will be back to grab my stuff, and then I'll be in the lab.